Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood besides them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Alleluia. We arrive at Easter Sunday, the point toward which all of this has been trending for weeks and weeks in a row now, and the point out of which all the rest of the season to follow comes. So as praying about all of this and the celebration of Easter, I remembered a question I was asked years ago by a priest. He said, what do you think the moment of the resurrection was like? You know, no one was there to see it firsthand. We found the empty tomb and the angels and the, the garments rolled up, but what was that moment like? And it's, it's fun to kind of pray with and ponder. There's no revealed uh, moment in scripture that we actually say is dogmatically, doctrinally, this is exactly what it was like, what happened. It was kind of hidden, it was a secret moment. No one was exactly there at the very second of the resurrection. But as it occurred, something quiet, but earth shattering, went out to the ends of the universe. Because at the moment of the resurrection, the entire fabric of creation was modified. That a story that used to end in death now is opened into eternal life. The resurrection touches upon every molecule of created existence as God has finally accomplished what he promised and what we waited for for so very long, the redemption of the entire created order. It's worth pondering throughout this day and throughout the Easter season, that moment, that sacred moment that was so very hidden because affecting everything, it also occurred in secret. And I think that stands as a pretty good image form for the way that God operates within our lives. That often these greatest moments, moments that shatter chains, moments that liberate us from the darkness, moments that change everything, sometimes occur so deeply and so secretly that we don't even really quite know how to describe them. They happen in the secret recesses of the heart as the resurrection, as it were, occurred in the secret place of the tomb that was emptied, shattered, broken by the power of life itself. I was praying as well a number of years ago in a way that has changed the way that I pray with Easter. And it's again to look to Our Lady that as on Holy Saturday, we sit with her in the quiet in her hopefulness, her waiting, her pondering with a broken heart. Lord, I know you're good to your promises. What are you doing? How are you going to bring this about? I've often sat with her in that moment, especially as the news came back that the tomb was empty and the disciples weren't sure what to make of that. Did they take his body? What happened here? What exactly is going on? And how do we make sense of it in the light of everything that's preceded it? I just have to wonder if Our Lady, having sat there for what seemed like endless hours on end, pondering the promises, knowing the Father was at work, knowing that her Son was going to bring completion to all things, I have to wonder if she heard that word that may have puzzled everybody else. I wonder if she just had this moment where she said, ah, that's my boy. There he is. Yes. And I wonder if she let them run to the tomb and she waited for them to come back. I wonder if perhaps maybe he first appeared to her, even if later we know in scripture that Mary Magdalene is the first to see him. I wonder what it was like for her in those very first moments to say, ah, okay, Lord, I see what you have done. It was very difficult the way you chose to bring this about. It is not the pathway perhaps that she might have chosen for herself, but is that not our story? That God so very often chooses to bring about the greatest and the richest of his mighty works through pathways we would not have maybe chosen ourselves. I ponder as well a scene that's not in scripture, but it's the scene of the disciples sitting around with Jesus risen and our lady in the room. And I ponder her sitting at Christ's side, perhaps on the ground, leaned up against him as he's speaking to the disciples. And in this prayer and this meditation that I've sat with for years now, Our Lady is just holding his pierced hand. And I just picture her tracing the mark of the nail over and over again, adoring the wound as she ponders to herself, oh, this is how you chose to do it, Lord. This is how you chose to redeem the entire created order. This is how you chose to save us. This is how you chose to do everything good for life. And see, I wonder if her pondering there in this pierced heart of her own, filled with seven sorrows now, glorified and redeemed, I wonder if she just had these moments of recognizing how the power of God plays out so often through tremendously painful and broken pathways. That sometimes our ideal of the way that God will come and save us doesn't really match the reality, the grit, the day-to-day, -day, the grist of what it is to live in a fallen world filled with poverty, filled with sorrow, filled with death. 
but through all of that comes life. The pattern of Jesus Christ, the way that he chose to accomplish this again may be surprising, but certainly, indeed, just right. Because there's nothing wrong. God's plan is unimaginably perfect, as has been said. That the way he chooses to bring this all about, we just couldn't even dream it up. But it is a pathway of salvation that plays out in each of our stories over and over and over again. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I often ponder as well in that scene, Our Lady just looking up at her son with an imploring glance. And Jesus, not needing to hear her words, knowing what she's asking for, I imagine him drawing back his cloak his garment to reveal to her the wound of his side. And I imagine her just placing her hand upon his open side from which was born the church, all of us, the sacramental font. And I just wonder if as she held her hand to that place and she recognized the surprising and the magnificent fashion in which God himself has conquered death, I picture her repeating the words of the prologue of John's gospel. It's just my own theory, but I think she might have composed those words. And John the Beloved was sitting there. He's like, well, I'm gonna take that down. That's pretty good. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the darkness has not overcome. Be that as it may, as we ponder the resurrection, as we ponder the power of God to work everything out in a manner that we just don't often perceive, it's worth recognizing the pathway that brought us here was difficult, huh? Lent is not an easy season, as we said at the very beginning. And the way that if you've come with me in the journal in these videos, the way we've confronted all of this is to deal with rather than flee from all of these broken places, to press into them rather than move away from or seek to, to go around them, rather to let the story, the pattern of the incarnation and the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to, to trace that pattern onto our own stories and to let it play out as it were again and again and again through the liturgy, but through also through our prayer in a fashion that unites our stories more perfectly to the one great story that brings everything into one. He is risen. <laughs> and so we hear again and again and again that great hymn, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? For the one final moment that seemed to be the object and the source of all of our fears, our death has been opened into the entry point now into the fulfillment of all of our desires, that which surpasses even the wildest dreams of the human heart, because no eye has seen no ear has heard, nor has it even so much as dawned upon us what God has prepared for those who love him. He is risen, as he said he would. Alleluia. Happy Easter, my friends. I pray that this one is filled with celebration unlike any before it. God bless you.